we're looking at an assembly of heat sinks and voltage regulators. I've done two of them already and I'm going to show you as we do the third one how it's done. So one of these is a negative voltage regulator for 12 volts, a positive voltage regulator for 12 volts. You'll notice that this heat sink is longer than the other two. This is the one for the 5 volt regulator. Also please note that these regulators are not interchangeable. What we're going to do is take the 5 volt regulator, just like we've done the others. We'll take a 5 volt regulator and some thermal compound. And I've just put it on my finger, which was in retrospect silly. I should have just put it straight on there. But at some point, your finger is going to get in and have a good time anyway, spreading it around. So it really doesn't much matter. Kind of a thin film. It's a bit thick, like thinly spread peanut butter. And wipe that off so we don't get it on the leads and everywhere else. And if you'll notice, there are three holes in the heat sink. And the hole in the regulator will match up with the center of the three holes. And we'll use number four hardware to hold it in place. And we'll finish it off with a screwdriver. And before we tighten it up all the way, we'd like to make sure that the leads are quite straight. And now we'll just finish it up, be official. Use a nut driver and a screwdriver, and hopefully it won't shift too much if it does. You'll have to play with it again. Looks pretty good. And now we'll take each of these regulators and we're going to install them into the board. And I'll show you on say, one of the regulators on a short heat sink. Now, where did I put my jeweler's loop? Thank you, Ben. I'm going to because my vision isn't so great, I'll use my jeweler's loop to take a look and make sure which of the regulators this one is. And this is the 7912, and that is also known as U1. So we'll find the U1 place on the silk screen. And now we'll put the regulator in. We'll go leads first. And if everything was pretty straight, it should sit down nicely onto the board. And you'll notice there are the three leads of the regulator. And here are two pins. And those two pins hold the heat sink in place. This is a special soldering operation. And it really depends on getting a lot of heat and good contact. So clean the tip, put a little bit of solder on the tip, and then we'll sandwich solder between the tip and the post. That gives us a good start. We'll just kind of sit and wait a bit because we've got a lot of metal and we've got to get it all pretty hot. We're going to feed a little solder at a time. And we'll just not fiddle with it so that it can so that it can solidify without a problem. And we check on the board. Turns out we did a pretty good job. It's all straight. Everything's level. So we'll do the other lead. in very much the same fashion. 
take a little time and a little bit of heat. Patience is important. And then, of course, don't forget to solder those three leads for the regulator. Now you'll go around checking carefully that you're putting the right regulator in the right location, and you'll finish up installing the regulators. And we'll find the chassis connectors. That's basically got connectors and switches and feet and things like that. And I think we're going to need some screws. And there's another envelope that has lots of screws. There it is. And it's called PR-102 Screw Nut Lug. And everything we need to attach the feet will be right there. One, two, three. Got to find one more foot. Some people might argue that this would be a good time to pour this all out into the white bowl, but we'll do it the hard way for now. But I think you guys probably would want to pour it into the bowl. Okay, and now we've got to find the right screws. And according to the manual, the right screws are 632 by a half inch Phillips, and they are silver in color. Let's scramble through the screws here looking for four of those 632s. There's one, two, three, four. 632 by one half. And you'll notice the threaded holes around the outside of the chassis. So we'll kind of get things more or less in the right ballpark. And we'll pop the screws on. Do we have a screwdriver? We have a screwdriver. Is it the right size? Close enough for government work. Used to have a music teacher called Ken Adams. And whenever we would tune, he would say, close enough for jazz. Looks like now it's time to remove the lid. 11 screws, six, two, and three along the back. You'll need a small Phillips head screwdriver to do that. I won't bore you with that. You know where the screws are. And uh, we'll see you in a second for the next step. With all 11 screws removed, remove the lid set it aside in a safe place. Back into the shipping box would be one good idea of a safe place. And now we're going to go back into the chassis connector envelope. And I did chicken out and I kind of put everything into a paper plate so I could sort through it. There's a pink envelope inside. The pink envelope has the infrared window and a piece of tape that's specially cut to fasten the infrared window to the front of the chassis right over here. And we'll do that operation now. The infrared plastic typically will have a release paper on one or two sides. Take off the release paper because we won't use that. It's done its job by protecting the surface during transit. And then the next thing we're going to do is we'll pull off the backing paper on this piece of tape. And that's a little bit touchy. And uh, then we'll take that piece of tape and affix it to the infrared window. Let's see if we can get that done. The knife blade makes a pretty good way to get it started. Hopefully we won't tear it up. And once you've got the release paper off of one side, you can use the release 
paper for the adhesive kind of hold it all in place when you place it on the window and now you can safely remove the release paper and all the sticky remains behind on the infrared window. Here's the hole that we're aiming for and what we want to do is just kind of going by eye evenly space the window above the hole and press it in place. Now if you notice I'm a little bit crooked but there's plenty of margin on the window such that when you look from the outside it will appear perfect. And you'll notice there's the window in place and it looks perfect. Now it's time to install the convenience outlets into the back panel, the power entrance connector into the back panel, and then we'll install the switch. I'll just do that here as we are live. Insert it from the back. I will say that the convenience outlet fit is snug, but have faith and they snap in just like they were made to. So let's go and we'll grab another convenience outlet. And it's always worth double checking the picture in the version of the manual that I'm looking at. It would be figure 12. So we get the orientation right. Although it turns out you couldn't put these in upside down because of the way the slots are keyed. And once again, we'll put this guy there and we have perfect faith. All right. Here's the power entrance connector. And we just double check the picture to make sure we're going to get the power entrance connector in in the correct orientation. And we give it a push and we're good. And now it's time to install the switch. And the switch goes into the front panel. And once again, we want to always double check our picture to make sure that we install it the same way the picture shows us. One going up, put the switch in. Takes a little bit of force. And just before I click it into place, yes, the one is up. And we're good. Now we're going to wire up the convenience outlets, the power switch, and the power entrance connector. And we do that with a bunch of harnesses that are largely constructed in advance. And they use a kind of a connector called a fast-on. It's a push-on terminal. It's nicely insulated. We do that to minimize the chance of you ever touching 120 or 240 volts if the preamp's open. So digging through the box, you'll find this bag and it's got all the various wiring kits. And what we'll be is looking for the different fast on assemblies as identified by the manual. There are a variety of different assemblies with fast ons. Your job is going to be to read the manual and make sure that you match the colors and the lengths to get them in the right place. So we'll very carefully read the directions and it says locate the black unswitched power harness. It has black wire, that's black wire, and three fast ons. One, two, three. Then it says connect the blue quarter inch wide fast on, that's this one to the IEC power entrance connector contact closest to the chassis wall. Power entrance connector is this guy down here at the bottom. And the contact closest to the chassis wall is this one. Just doing that by feel, but yeah, I've got it. And what we're going to do is we'll push that guy on. little wiggling helps usually. One connection down. Then it says connect the red 187 wide fast on to the unswitched outlet contact closest to the chassis wall. 
All right, that's the little short guy, the red one. And we're going to connect it to the unswitched. The unswitched is this one. You can see it marked on the chassis. And we'll go once again to the connector closest to the chassis wall. And get my head out of the way so you can see it. And once again, the secret is you may have to wiggle this guy. Oh, seems like he's on. If you want to make doubly sure, you can grab uh, some needle nose pliers. And that'll get you a little bit more uh, pushing force. And that's seated well. And it says for now, we're going to leave the remaining long end with the fast on connector loose. So we'll do that. All right. Now, actually, you guys don't really need this. You can just read the manual, but eh, sometimes it's nice to see it this way. Now it says connect the white unswitched power harness. It has white wire and three fast ons. Let's see. That's that one. It has white wire and just two fast ons. Nope, not that one. White wire, three fast ons. Okay. And it says connect the blue quarter inch wide fast on to the IEC power contact farthest from the chassis wall. Okay, that's this one. And a little wiggle. And he's on. And I'm going to cheat and use this guy. It'll help me push him in place. Okay, and he's seated. And it says connect the red 187 wide fast on to the unswitched outlet contact farthest from the chassis wall. All right, that's this guy. And we'll put him on by a bit. And this makes it a little easier to push it. Uh, that works well. And for now, we're going to remove, leave the remaining end loose. And then it says, twist the white and black guys together to form an insulated twisted pair. All right, we can do that. A couple more twists. Make it look good. And the purpose of this twisting is it keeps AC power voltages from radiating hum fields in the box. That's the benefit of the twisting. Now it says we're going to insert a small pair of cable ties into the tie-down points and lay the twisted pair over it. And we're going to look for a couple of cable ties. Ah, we got them. There's the cable ties. And we'll pop them in there, just like it says. And once again, all of this is in the manual, but you know, sometimes it's just handy to have, see somebody do it. I mean, that's how uh, PBS has made a living for low these many years, as everybody sees what the guys on this old house do. Always seems easy when they do it. Uh, there we go. Just gotta pull it up. There we go. Okay, with that done, we're going to connect the black wire of the twisted pair to the bottom row switch contact closest to the chassis wall. All right, that actually makes sense. Isn't that good? I'll show it to you in a second. Twist the edge a bit more. 